So Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17. And we want to look at this morning a portion of Scripture. We want to look at verses 10 through 13. And that's what we'll be focusing on this morning in our study. So here we are in Matthew chapter 17. The disciples, or his disciples asked him, Why then do the scribes say Elijah must come first? And he answered them and said, And the he here is Jesus, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah's already come. And they did not recognize him, but did, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And the disciples, the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the baptizer. You may be seated. Bow with me as I pray unto our Lord. Dear God, to the self-existing one, we come this morning with an understanding that, that you are needed in our lives. The need to know you grows daily. And as we come, we want to understand the scriptures. Oh, how we long to desire in knowing you. Open our sinful minds. Open our sinful hearts. Point out the sin that keeps us from being truthful to you. You is what we need. More of you in our lives, less of me in our lives. Tender Holy Spirit, speak to us. We are listening. Holy Spirit, speak to us. We want to learn. And I pray this morning in the name of the Father and the Son and the tender Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. We are in Matthew's Gospel. And we have been traveling through Matthew's Gospel since Matthew chapter 1. And I want to thank those of you who are diligently coming alongside of us. And we are now in chapter 17. And we looked at 17 in, in our previous Sunday. In this section of scripture, this section of scripture is so important to the life of the believer. It was so important to the disciples then. It's so important to us this morning. And we looked at a, a graphic picture of the kingdom of God. We saw in our previous Sunday human witnesses. And we saw the, the, the shining glory, the Shekinah glory in Christ. And the human witnesses are, are Peter and James and John. And they're standing there watching the Shekinah glory unveil in front of them. In fact, Peter is so moved with this, with what his eyes see. He says, Lord, let me build some tabernacles. Let me build three booths so we can, we can enjoy this so the, the linger of the glory can, can be with us for a long time. He wants to build a tabernacle. Well, as they were gazing upon Moses, as they gazed upon Elijah, as they see Christ in all his glory, Moses represented the, the law in the Old Testament. And Elijah represented the uh, the prophets of old. And, and this is a, a, a visible picture. It's a sign. It's a sign of, of what is about to come. And there are people even today looking forward to the second of coming of Christ. And, and we know many men are, are teaching about the book of Revelation or teaching about the, the book of Daniel. And they can hardly wait because they think it's time that Christ is coming, but we don't know when he's coming. We are to come, we are to, to hope, and we have an expectation that Christ is coming. We see something that we've never seen before. And you can only imagine these three guys as they, as they look at the Shekinah glory of, of these three men and they're, and they're, and they're, and the, and Christ's face shining. It's like Moses when he came off the mountain 
He was light. He he shined, in the, and he didn't even have a. He wasn't even aware of that. But what we what we are noticing here, this is a, a fulfillment of the expectation of the Jews are, are are they're finally getting it, or are they getting it? Well, the law is being fulfilled, and and Christ is a perfect fulfillment of that. Christ is, was preached, and it was. It was prophesied that he would come and he would fulfill prophecy. And we see the, the fullness of, and the perfect, the perfect sacrifice. We're going to see that in Jerusalem and months to come. This is a rare privilege. And only three men get to see this. And, and we began this uh, study in, back in chapter 16. When Christ looks at Peter and ask him, who do people say that I am? And then he asks him another question, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And this was a test to Peter to find out exactly where he was coming from, exactly how much are they getting it? And we see here, flesh and blood could not reveal that to Peter, but only the Spirit of God. And that from that point on, Christ speaks to them about the cross. And in three days, he rose from the grave. Now, now Peter said, this is not going to happen to you, Jesus. I won't let them kill you. I won't let this. And then Christ says, get behind me. He kind of rebukes him. And, and when we, and we think about that, we think that maybe Peter got it. And then we say, maybe he didn't get it. Maybe he doesn't fully understand the theology of the Bible. Because he's rebuked by Jesus. Does Peter get it? Does he really get it? The, the, the Messiah was to bring them hope. Was to bring the people of Israel hope. And bring humanity hope to those who would believe. Yeah. Jesus is about to go to the cross and die. You see, Israel wanted a liberator. They wanted somebody to they wanted somebody to help them from the oppression of Rome. They were not looking for a spiritual leader. They were looking for a physical leader. One would take the oppression. One who would remove the, the yoke from their necks. And that's like people today. People don't really want Jesus. They just want a better marriage. People don't really want Jesus. They just want to win the lottery. People don't really want Jesus. Jesus. They just want a better life now. And that's not the gospel. That is not the gospel. Christ is declaring that he's the Messiah. But they don't see that. They don't truly understand that. The, the Jewish people, the people of Israel. But I want to move your eyes to chapter 17. And what's really neat from our previous lesson, we see Elijah, we see Moses, and we see Jesus. And there's a voice that comes from heaven, and it says, listen to my son. And these guys are so overwhelmed, they fall on their face. They fall on their face, and they're, 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 they're speechless, and they have to be touched by Christ to, to get their attention again. How many times have we come to the scriptures and we read the scriptures and the scriptures leaps off the page and, he, and it chokes us and we look at it and we say, Lord, forgive me. I'm humbled by your word. I am taken by your word. How many times do we fall on our face and ask Lord to forgive us of our sin? I had an opportunity to talk to somebody this past week and share with them the scriptures. They had never seen the Bible. They've never opened the scriptures. And I took them to Romans chapter 3. And we are told never to take people to Romans. Take them to John. Take them to a, a psalm. Or take them maybe to a Proverbs. But Romans? I'll tell you that in the rest of the story in just a bit. But here we are. Here, here we, we're looking at John, excuse me, Matthew chapter 17. And in our previous chapter... These guys, uh, Christ tells them to pick up the cross. He's challenging his disciples to pick up your cross and follow me. And from this point on, the pace picks up. 
and because Christ is looking toward Jerusalem. And he's looking toward Jerusalem to die. He understands that. I don't know if the disciples truly get it, or truly understand him, but this point on, they are challenged. But the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And after he says, listen to him, as you look at the progression of the chapter, as you read the scriptures of the chapter, Christ says, tell no one. Tell no one. Tell no one what you have seen until after the resurrection. And those of you who have done your homework, you went to Peter, correct? And you read chapter, you read 1 Peter 1, and you read Peter, 2, Peter, uh, 2 Peter, and you saw that, that Peter talked about the Messiah. He was there. He saw the glory of God. They had the privilege of watching this Shekinah glory right before. And what chapter 16 of Matthew is, it's declaring who Christ is. And as we look, when we looked at chapter 17, as we began chapter 17, Elijah comes up. And somehow the disciples missed it. And you would think the disciples, you would think the disciples who were Jewish men would have learned that in 101 Sunday school in the synagogue. Surely they talked about Elijah. Surely they talked about Moses. And yet the disciples, again, I'm questioning whether or not how much they grasp this. It's kind of like a new Christian. Never tell the new Christian to read the book of Revelation. Never tell somebody to dive into the Old Testament and then the new. It is not like a novel. It is not like a, a, a uh, mystery book that you read from the beginning and you go to the end. The scriptures is not like that. And the only way you are going to fully understand the book of Daniel, the only way you're going to fully understand the Old Testament is you have to read the New. You have to go through the New. People often uh, uh, talk to me, well, I'm going to read through Genesis. I'm going to read through through First and Second Kings. We're going to, by the way, we're going to get to Second Kings shortly. And I say, don't read that. And they look at me like deer in headlights, like I'm like I'm trying to cover, uh, like I'm trying to pr protect me, and and because I because I, I would say I don't think you're getting you're gonna get it. Well, you think you know more than me? Well, I know a little bit. I don't know more than you, but I know a little bit. I don't know that much. But oftentimes I'll tell people to stay out of the Old Testament. I have a friend that I'm discipling in Los Angeles, and he, I'm kind of his. He, Kind of holds him, I hold him accountable. You knew Christian. He texted me and said, I finished the good book of John. I said, Excellent. Now go back and read it again. <laughs> and this time take a red pencil with you and underline what you liked. And after he gets done, I'm going to tell him, Go read it again and use a pencil now and read what you liked. The Bible is not like a book, a, a, Grish, a Grisham book. It's not like that. It is to take seriously. It is to, to ponder what you read. It is to journal what your thoughts are according to that. This, this morning, uh, Kim, uh, Kim put on the, on the screen, Valley of Vision. There's a book written by Puritan writers of poetry. And maybe you don't appreciate poetry. When you start reading the scriptures and when you start reading poetry and songs of men and women who have gone on before us and they've gone to the well, they've dug deep and they begin to journal that, they begin to write that, just like the songs we sing are probably penned from someone's journal. Listen closely when you hear Pastor Robert pray. That's his prayer. That's what he wrote. And oftentimes we must do that. When we read the scriptures, when we put it in our lives, then the Spirit of God tunes in with Him and we put on paper what we're thinking. It's not about you. It's about you and Christ. So here we are in 17, and Christ fulfills. He fulfills the prophecy. And the disciples, we see 
Do they really understand the significance of Elijah there? Do they see the significance of John the Baptist, the John Baptizer? They see Christ because they're walking with him. How much theology do they know? I don't know how long you've been a Christian, but how much, how much theology do you know? And theology is the, the study of God. Theo, meaning God, logi, study of God. Ladies and gentlemen, these are interesting days. Don't waste your time following the talking heads. Limit yourself on YouTube. I speak to myself because I figured out there's free movies there. And I saw the Broncos in eight minutes yesterday. <laughs> Had to throw that in there, Barry. Here we are in chapter 17. The voice says, this is my son. Listen to him. And Jesus says, not yet. Jesus says the scriptures will fulfill Israel. Israel is going to be liberated, delivered. But stop and think about it for a second. Just think about it for a second. Israel wants to be rescued from their political tyranny. And Christ wants to give them spiritual, spiritual relief. And most people today are only looking for the spirit of physical relief. They're not looking for the spiritual relief. And that's the big idea, and that's the problem with the Jewish people. That was the problem of the that was a problem back then, because they were looking for the Messiah to rescue them from the oppression. But he wouldn't come. And what what they're doing here on on, on this mountain of transfiguration, he's giving them an ex, a glimpse of the Messiah. It's only a glimpse of the glory of of God. Only a glimpse of it. So much we want to see. So much we want to learn. So much we want to we want to see the scriptures and we, we want to read them and we want, we want to get to know God more. I'm going to ask Tim to go on the screen and put up the quote of the week by, by Paul David Tripp. And I honestly believe that. I honestly believe what, what David Tripp said here uh, on the screen. Uh, it was so true. Only when sin breaks your heart will the coming of the Messiah excite you. When Christ dominates our life, when we know Jesus as our, as our Savior, when we think about Him, when we think about Him, we're going to get excited about His the second coming. We're not excited about him because, oh, he's going to come and rescue us from our credit cards. No! He's going to rescue us because Christ sent his son to die so that we can be with him. I have told people, and I know you're getting tired of hearing it, but you've got to hear it one more time before we move on. Heaven is a better place. Amen. Heaven's a better place. And the problem with, with people on earth, believers and non-believers, are so distracted from the other things. There's so many distractions that keep us from focusing on Christ. There's so many distractions that keep us from, from, from Him. And here they are. The disciples are asking Jesus a question. And the question is, it, it's about the, this transfiguration. Look with me to the text in Matthew 17, verse 10. And his disciples asked him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah will come first? The scribes were the theologians of the Jewish system, of the culture. They were the expert of the Old Testament law. They taught that Elijah had to come before the Messiah. The implications of the disciples' question to Christ and the scribes was, was contending on that, that since Elijah had come, the, the Messiah must have come, mustn't come either. And that's why they were questioning. But where's Elijah? So if Elijah didn't come, where's Christ? I mean, where's the Messiah? 
So anyone claimed that Jesus might, might be the Messiah was not true because Elijah hadn't come. And Elijah's coming was the last prophetic or the last prophecy recorded in the Old Testament and the book of Malachi. That's the book right before Matthew. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, he reads like this. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. With this pro prophecy in their mind, the Jewish people, they awaited for Elijah. 400 years they waited. Whenever they celebrated the Passover, they would keep a chair, an empty chair at the table and hoping that Elijah would occupy it. Would this be the night he comes? The Jewish people still to this very day celebrate the Seder and they're oftentimes still bringing that chair out waiting for Elijah. And those of you who know your Old Testament history know that Elijah didn't die like Moses. He just rode his chariot and he went to heaven. That's a different story. That's a, another Bible, Bible story. We could talk about it another time. But we see here Peter, James, and John. They were convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And remember, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter says this. All three men saw Jesus transfigure. Remember the word transfigure, and you wrote it on your Bible. Metamorphosis. The same idea of what happens to a butterfly. He changes. And just for a second, when you receive, when you receive, when you believe in Christ as your Savior, there's a change in your life. You're not the same guy. You're not the same gal. There's a transformation. There's a metamorphosis in one person's life. You desire to hear the word. You desire to hear the word from the beginning to the end. You don't come to church and say, okay, it's time for me to leave. And then you leave and you don't get the whole counsel of God. Why would somebody come and then leave? Well, unless their phone is vibrating and somebody's calling them. There's an emergency. But all three men saw Jesus transfigure. They saw this transfigure in the mountain and they witnessed the divine glory of God. I keep going back to this. And let me share with you a, a habit that I do in preparing the message, in preparing any lesson, whether it's on a, a Wednesday or, or, or whether it's on a Sunday or if I'm asked to go somewhere, Ladies and gentlemen, what I do is go back to the text. I go back to the text and I start with verse 1 and I read the chapter all the way to the end. I continue to saturate my mind, to saturate my heart. And, and that's an encouragement to you as well. Why were the scribes insisting that Elijah had to come? Why were they insisting that he had to come before the Messiah? Why was that a big deal? As they saw it, the Messiah had to come, and Elijah had to come before him. Now the disciples obviously saw, and they recognized Moses. They recognized Elijah. And Peter spoke of him by name in this chapter, verse 4. And what the disciples witnessed caused, caused the disciples to question Elijah that he had come before Moses. And, and as we look at the next verse, verse 11, it reads like this. And he answered and he said, Elijah's coming 
and will restore all things. Ladies and gentlemen, if you were there with Jesus, I know, I know it's, a, it's, it's a rhetorical question. What would be the questions you would be asking Christ? I, I, what, what would you be asking? They mistreated Elijah. And Jesus said the scribes are, are right. They're correct. However, they added that Elijah had already come, but he was really John the baptizer. What did this mean? And when John appeared out in the wilderness, John wearing camel's hair, John who had a leather belt, John who ate gra uh, grasshoppers and unfiltered honey and caused them to think and caused them to make comparisons toward Elijah. In 2 Kings chapter 1, he spent time as a fugitive in the desert. And we know, those of you who know your Old Testament, know that ravens fed Elijah. And in, in 1 Kings chapter 17, the, the, Jewish, the Jewish religious authorities from Jerusalem sent a group of people, a group of people to, to see John and specifically ask John the baptizer, Are you Elijah? What does John say? Uh, no, I am not. In John chapter 1. John was the fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy. And here we see the connection with El we see the connection with, with Jesus and Elijah is explained. It is explained by the words of Gabriel. Remember Gabriel talked about John's birth and and John's father, who was Zechariah, and he says, he will also go before the Messiah and the spirit and the power of Elijah. Luke chapter 1. I, I am often, I am often pleasantly surprised when I meet somebody who has an Old Testament name how many Elijahs do you know? How many Moses do you know? I, I even met a guy at a restaurant who was waiting on us. His name was Solomon. And often I would ask him, why did your mama call you that? And then ask him, do you know, the, do you know what your name means? Do you know the significance of your name? Malachi's prophecy was not fulfilled by the second coming of Elijah himself, but by the coming one, he had the same spirit and he came with the power of Elijah, who was John the baptizer. Remember, Jesus said, Elijah has come already and they did not know him. Jesus and Elijah. Jesus and Elijah, very significant in their life, will feel persecution. They will endure persecution. And you know the story in, in 1 Kings chapter 18 about a woman named Queen Jezebel. When Elijah challenges her and the, the prophets of Elijah, excuse me, the prophets of Baal, and there's a, there's a, a challenge between uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and there's a, a challenge going down about a particular fire that they wanted to burn these bulls. And the prophets of Baal can't do it. Elijah pours water on these bulls, so, bulls and he, he soaks the wood. And it's a challenge between the prophets of Baal and the challenge of, or, or between Elijah. And, and only a prophet could do that. Fire comes from heaven. You thought transfiguration was incredible. And can you imagine fire from heaven? And ladies and gentlemen, if you read the scriptures closely, if they warm your heart, when Christ comes back, that's going to be a spectacular event. We can't even imagine. 
We can even, our, our little pea brain can imagine what's going to take place. And I know some of you want to be here. And, and I've heard Christians say, get them, Lord. Not me. And you know why I say that? Because you imagine all the people that don't believe. And we know where people go when they don't believe. John MacArthur said, your better life is now if you're on your way to hell. The people immediately proclaimed that God was on the side of Elijah. And he ordered them to capture and execute all the prophets of Baal. This is in, in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 1 Kings chapter 19. This is a serious story, and this is, this is a story that should humble us and cause our, our heart to ache toward God. Elijah was hunted. Elijah was hunted, he was sought after, and he was pursued by wicked people. Most of his life he was hunted, and people wanted to get him. So we have Elijah, and we have John the baptizer. They both were despised. And they both were hated and killed by wicked kings. You know how G you know how John the Baptizer died. He came as a forerunner. He came as a forerunner of the Messiah. And he ministered in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Herod put John the Baptizer in prison. And you know the story. There was a party going on and Herod gets drunk and he tells his stepdaughter, what do you want? And they want, according to his stepdaughter, he's influenced by the mother and they want John the Baptizer's head on a platter. Why did these prophets suffer? Why did Elijah suffer so much? Why did King Ahab call him O troubled Israel in 1 Kings chapter 18? Even though he and Jezebel were the true troubles of Israel. People, people, ladies and gentlemen, there are those who don't love the church. There are those who don't love Christ. There are those who come to the service at the 11 o'clock holy hour just to cause heartache for believers. It, it was because he brought the truth of God to a nation in the midst of his corruption. Because what he stood for and what he hated and why was John the baptizer put in in prison, and we, we know that because he shook his finger. He pointed his finger and he told the king that you're living in adultery. Adultery is any type of sex outside the marriage bed. And he pointed his finger to him. The prophets of old didn't have large congregation, didn't have very many following them. But they stood up in the power of Elijah proclaiming God or you'll die. Old Testament prophets were mistreated. They were mistreated and so was the Son of God. And Jesus warns the disciples. He warns the disciples likewise. And he says the Son of Man must come and the Son of Man must suffer. He must suffer at the hands of other men. Elijah was hunted. John the baptizer was, was hunted and put to death. Jesus was going to be mistreated. Jesus was going to be put to death by the Jewish leaders. His crimes his crime speak the truth. And, and just let me emphasize this. Yeah, physically he was going to be killed by the Jewish leaders. But ladies and gentlemen, we know because we've read the full pages of the Bible and we know the gospel, we put Christ on the cross. And one of the things you need to understand, one of the things we all need to understand here, 
His disciples are learning as they go. We already have read the scripture. We could see it. The disciples didn't see it. They were just experiencing it. It's on you today. We are at advantage over the disciples because we have the written word in our hands. Jesus is going to be mistreated. He was going to be put to death by the Jewish people. And the crime that Christ committed was he was speaking the truth. If Jesus was Jesus, it was Jesus. He was, a, he was a great man. He was a man of peace. One of the greatest men who ever lived. And why did so many people hate him? Why did so many people want to kill him? Because he spoke the truth. And you may be standing for truth in your family. You may be standing the truth in your church. You may be standing on, in, in your neighborhood, on your block. You may be the only one speaking the truth. Stand tall in the, in the power and the spirit of Elijah. All of us must stand tall and understand that. I like what Fanny Crosby said. And we know Fanny Crosby who wrote over 4,000 hymns in, in in her, in her life, she was literally blind. This is one of her quotes. She said, take the world, give me Jesus. In his cross, my trust shall be, till with clearer, brighter vision, face to face, my Lord, I see. That's such a profound, that's such a profound quote taken from a woman who was blind. Jesus' words were a wake-up call. They were a wake-up call to Peter. They were a wake-up call to John. They were a wake-up call to James. And just as, as, as John was treated, so the, excuse me, just as John was treated, so the Jews are going to treat me as well. These are the words of Christ. And he said, and he said, so in spite of the glory you have just seen on this mountain, not a time for, not a time to hesitate, but a time for the glory of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we must understand, I'm not going to get all the theology that we can learn from the Bible in our lifetime, but one of the, one of the, one of the subjects that we mustn't forget, or we mustn't Audit is the is the the teaching and the theology of the cross. Of those of us who were raised in a in a Catholic environment, every Sunday would see a cross with a body on it. That's not correct. And when we truly understand the, the theology of the cross, we would know that there's no body on the Christ on the cross because Christ came back to life. This is what the Lord has, has taught us. This is what the Lord has, wants us to, to understand. And, he, and from that point on, as I said earlier, he looks toward Jerusalem. One of the things that caused me to reflect on the Old Testament, I'm, I'm reading a book right now called uh, Brave by Faith by a man named Alistair Begg. He's not an old dead guy. He's still alive. And, and, and I, I see here in the Old Testament the prophets of the Old Testament warn the people. I, I'm not saying we're prophets here. But we must not turn our gospel message into one that tells people that they're super and tells people that they're neat and tells people, oh, you know what you need in your life? You just need to upgrade in your life. You need to, you need to, you need to come to Jesus so you can be more awesome. Don't tell people that. The gospel is very clear. And the gospel tells us that we are in need of the mercy of God. That's what we need. We do not deserve his grace. We do not deserve his mercy, but because he loves us, he gives us his mercy. The gospel is not, help me because I'm a little anxious. Help me because I'm a little nervous. 
Help me because I want peace with God. No, no, no. The, do- the gospel does not give us a direction in our lives and to help us live better and gives us more financially. No. The gospel is that you are blind and you need to see Jesus. One day we're going to face judgment. And unless we swallow our pride and humble ourselves, we will never be able to enjoy the grace of God. How many times have you asked the Lord to humble you so that you would get out of the way and you would see more of Him? The prophets of the Old Testament message is big enough and reminds us enough to bring us to repentance, to bring us to know God. Everyone when they see the power of the scriptures, must come to understand that they cannot live without God. God's plan for us is to go to our neighbor, go to those whom we know, those who are the strongest and the most resistant of the gospel. We want to go to them. I spoke with a man named Anthony this past week. Anthony told me, don't try to convert me. I like when people say that. I don't run when people say that. And you know what my answer to them was? I remember a verse in the Bible that says, a gentle answer turns away what? Anger. Our job is not to convert people. And I told Anthony that. I'm not going to try to convert you. He claimed that he was in a particular religion, and that's fine. That's that's fine. I, yeah. Our job is not to con- convert people. Our job is to, not to win an argument. Our job is not to beat them up and say we want because we're smarter than you, because we know more theology than you. Theology than you. That's not our job. Our job is to communicate the gospel. God is big enough to do the rest. And according to the sovereign plan, he will build his church. I took Anthony to the scriptures. Anthony had never read the Bible. And that in itself should make us weak. There are people today who have never held the Bible in their hand. They have never looked at the scriptures in the Bible. And I took them to Romans and I had them read Romans chapter 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I asked Anthony, are you a sinner? According to that verse, all is all. In the Greek, it's all. Are you a sinner? And he said yes. So we began a relationship. Because after all, it's by the power of the resurrection, touching lives, building relationships to the glory of God, that's what we're called to do, to point people to, to Christ. Because we, we can't convert anybody. We don't do that. It's not our job. You're not the spirit of someone else. You're just the middleman. Let's pray. Dear Lord, your word has caused us to ponder the scriptures. We will leave this room today thinking about your son. We will leave today possibly knowing a little bit more about you. We are glad that you have not abandoned us. We are not orphans in this room. Your truth is always available to us. You're here. You're real. And today's lesson will help us to think about the second coming. And that's what we see here, a glimpse of Christ's second coming. Help us to communicate this truth to others so that they may enjoy what we're enjoying. Oh, how we need your word inside of us. Your word is truth. I pray this morning because of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.